Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 45th episode of The Manor Podcast. I'm your co-host, Roger Bodie, joined as always with my best friend and other co-host, Michael Hamilton. Michael, how does it feel to not win a Flesh and Blood tournament for once? <laughs> I don't win lots of Flesh and Blood tournaments. Name one Flesh and Blood tournament you didn't win. Oh, both the the 5K in Chicago this weekend and the AGE in California this weekend. That's the that you played in. You have to you you have to register in them. It doesn't count if I don't register. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, fair. Yeah. Um, well, I played in a, a Legion Tower Defense tournament last month and didn't win that one. <laughs> I think I think Pro Tour Lil was the last major tournament you enrolled in and did not win before this weekend. Um, is that true? I think so, because you won U.S. Nats, you won Worlds, <laughs> you won the Calling. <laughs> you won the Battle Harden on the first <laughs> or a little week. <laughs> I think that is true. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> and you missed out on top eight of Lil because of Prism. So you know what are you gonna do? Stupid Prism. Good riddance. I miss her. I miss her dearly. I don't. I could play my ice decks and ice decks are, well, maybe they're not the best right now. They are definitely playable. Yeah, you proved they're definitely playable. So you want to talk about (laughs) how the uh, meta seems to be shaking out now that we are starting to get adjusted to these outsiders, heroes, and cards? Yeah. So Rangers are very good. If there was any question there, Rangers are quite good. I think they might be the deck to beat, not Riptide, the other two. The other two are the decks to beat. Yeah, yeah. Riptide uh, <laughs> he definitely exists, that's for sure. He he sure is there. He sure, you can register Riptide for a tournament. Mm-hmm. That is a legal thing that you can probably be doing for the foreseeable future. You can also register Lavia for a tournament. I don't know which is better. Probably Lavia. She at least starts at 40 life. <laughs> Why does Riptide <laughs> start at 38? <laughs> <laughs> because he does damage with the traps. The three traps are so good. And then the rest of his cards and stuff isn't great. But I don't know. Maybe there's something there. Maybe you can death dealer enough stuff with go again. I still haven't figured out Riptide Unlimited. So like maybe maybe the answer is the same. Like you figure out Riptide Unlimited and then you can figure out Riptide and Constructed. Maybe. But we definitely played in a 5K that did have one Riptide register in it, surprisingly he did not top eight. Um, I think he had a winning record, though, either 5, 2, and four, or 4, and 3. Okay, sure. Um, but I'm just going to read off the, the meta for the Chicago Brawl uh, over the past weekend, the 5K, for from the Realm Games hosted by MinMax Games. Uh, we had 15 Dromai, um, 14 Azalea, 13 Lexi, 11 Oldheim, 7 Icelander, 7 Usuri, 7 Katsu, 6 Viserai, 6 Fi, 5 Dash, 5 Dorinthia, 4 Bravo, 4 Briar, 3 Reinar, and 1 a piece of Arachne, Riptide, and Kano. So I guess based on just these numbers, why do Dromai players love Copium so much? <laughs> you, I know you hate Dromai. I think Dromai is a reasonable choice. What's a good matchup? <laughs> I think Dromai is a reasonable choice because theoretically she should be solid into Azalea. She has access to defense reactions. She has sand cover. She is happy to play sand cover, which kind of lets her double block big dominated arrows. Most of Azalea's on hits don't matter that much against Dromai. Like right in the ledger is rough, but the other ones shouldn't be too bad. And then Azalea is not great at killing dragons. So if Dromai is a playable hero, she should have a pretty good Azalea matchup. I mean, Sleep Dart just shuts Dromai down. Her drag is can't ever go again. Yeah, that's fair. I don't know if Sleep Dart's really... Is it in the in any of the Azalea decks? It's been popping seen? up. It's been popping okay. up here. I don't know if it was in Brody's list specifically, but I, de- I definitely was threatened with Sleep Darts over the weekend. Okay. Sleep Dart does seem very good in Dromai. Can't make Ash, can't give your dragons go again. Um, I'm seeing Fatigue Shots from Brody's deck. Fatigue Shots, one that Dromai doesn't mind too much. No, not really. 
then no sleep darts in levy stack either but i mean it's just an easy tech card if like they ever wanted to start caring about yeah. that matchup more mm-hmm. um so but theoretically if dromai is good she should be good into azalea if she is like what she's doing lines up well against what azalea is doing azalea doesn't isn't a deck that like naturally includes poppers i think we saw battering bolts in some azalea decks but like it's not it's not an error you're happy to include in your deck. You have like nine blues. You don't want a two cost error. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, I think like Dromai is a hero that still, in my opinion, hasn't been fully figured out. And she's done reasonably okay at some events, like <laughs> top eight worlds. Um, I might be the only tick mark on Dromai's top eight so despite being like the most played or second most played deck at every major tournament since then and has zero top eights and quite a few conversion issues on day twos yeah she was the most played in indianapolis too huh yeah she did she did win the the age this weekend there was a Dromai deck that won that yeah and she she beat up all the katsus i guess because katsu is the most played deck there so Dromai's good in the katsu confirmed i i wouldn't go that far <laughs> So, so i guess we <laughs> mentioned azalea uh lexi is also very good now right uh yeah i feel like lexi's matchups might be more polarized which is weird because i think up until now that's been the opposite mm-hmm. um and since she's not playing death dealer i would also imagine i might be talking a little bit out of my ass here but I just imagine in theory she's less consistent because Azalea has knocked the death death whistle and death dealer to constantly be drawing cards. And Lexi's really reliant on seeing three of a kind to start churning through her deck. So she really can't start digging up for these very powerful effects on arrows until she starts like going through these three of a kinds. And I think it's just easier for opponents to disrupt like a go wide strategy um like Lexi's as opposed to like a go tall strategy like is it like Azalea requires very specific answers in your deck in order to match up with her threats. Sure right? that that's fair. I think like Dominate is just harder to big dominate attacks are just harder to block than multiple small attacks. Whereas like multiple small attacks do kind of like tax you on breakpoints and stuff. Big dominate attacks you just can only block with one card. So yeah, so like the answers to like if like like if Lexi was the m- most played deck, I would say start bringing maybe could start considering fate for scenes or peace of minds just more to zero for four like four effects blocking. Whereas. You know, Azalea wants you to play more cards like unmovable or staunch response or things like that. I guess peace of mind is still good in both cases, but it's just, they're just different answers to the two decks. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So yeah, Lexi, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe more easily ans- answerable, but also potentially it wouldn't surprise me if Lexi is a little harder to find the right build of now that, like azalea just got all these great pumps and it's kind of the same thing azalea was doing before just with more better pumps and more better arrows at a new quiver whereas yeah. like lexi it's not exactly clear what you're supposed to be doing with her we saw a lexi list in the top eight that was playing like three copies of haka or falcon wing the new zero for three arrow and also playing art of wars i don't know if that's the right direction or if something else it's it's interesting. Absolutely. And Azalea also has their specialization quiver. So the quality of her arrows is just usually higher because she's just more naturally able to play effects that reward you for having the aim counters on your arrows, things like that, whether it be the non-attack actions or the arrows themselves. Whereas in Lexi, it is still quite the challenge to get aim counters on your arrows and if the arrows are all statted where they're just better with aim counters and one ranger gets aim counters and the other ranger doesn't get aim counters i mean it kind of makes sense why the ranger ranger with aim counters is doing a little bit better right now right yeah i guess i (laughs) i i don't know if i agree with that logic because like lexi does get to do some powerful things that azalea doesn't like 
She gets Voltaire. Um, Voltaire is very strong. Three of a kind is very strong. Rain Razors is very strong. I guess Azalea is playing Rain Razors, but I think Rain Razors out of Lexi hits a lot different than Rain Razors out of Azalea. Well, yeah, Rain Razors out of Lexi is usually at minimum six on our good turn and like at most eight, maybe 10, depending on how crazy you're going off with like an endless arrows combo or something like that and reload effects that you can potentially push through. Um, Get, getting six damage off of rain rage and azalea seems very hard to do like i think mm -hmm. four is probably gonna be what you actually see most often and like sometimes it'll be like two sure <laughs> two but plus normally when you're doing it on hit. for just two yeah that the on hit is what's gonna matter there at that point mm -hmm. um plus I, I i don't know that i think right now the most popular build of lexi is this fuseless build and Maybe it's just still good old Ice Lexi is the thing to be doing still because I think it's pretty undisputed that traditional Lexi really struggles into a deck like Azalea just because all of Azalea's on hits are super impactful into Lexi, especially right in the ledger. And Lexi can't really present anything as threatening in the matchup as Red in the Ledger. And as we were just saying, if Azalea is super consistent with between cards like Knock the Death Whistle and Codex, um, in order to like recur these find and recur this one very powerful effect in the matchup, it kind of makes sense why she is also favored in that matchup. Yeah, that's that's fair. Codex is kind of a messed up card, <laughs> jumping around a little bit. <laughs> yeah, good card confirmed. <laughs> I think it was in what like half of the top eight decks, five of the top eight. I think it was in two, four three, and legal to four. be in four. Yeah, four, four, half the top eight. Two, two Azaleas, Alexi, and the lone Usury in the top eight. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest thing we took away, or one of the biggest takeaways I have, is that maybe the power level, the, the power level of the card is very high, but I think it's one of those cards where people will just need to adjust their ideas of like what play patterns look like in a turn. We were just doing Manor University over the weekend, covering one of your matches against Brody Spurlock over the weekend. And we both kind of identified like you just hadn't played around codex of frailty right on one of your turn cycles. And if you just were more experienced in the matchup or just playing against that card, it would have given you a more winning opportunity in the match. So it really is it just the power of the, of the card pushing it through? It's just also players inexperience, like having this discard arsenal manipulation effect recurring throughout a game. Yeah, it's it's very weird. It's a very weird effect to have like a card. Basically, you have to discard a card and put a card from your graveyard into your arsenal. That's like not something we've ever seen anything like remotely similar to before. And in the past, like anything that's made you discard or lose cards from your hand, it's either been their action, so you don't have to like worry about that happening and then having to figure out blocks, or it's been an on hit from an arrow or something like that, or like a big Bravo attack or Oak and Old or something, where like you make your blocks and then you lose your cards, and then you're probably not getting attacked again unless it was an attack that like explicitly had go again, so that you like still have the option to block and see that. Whereas Codex, it's like you're this is played, you're discarding. And then they're going to shoot you with something. <laughs> yeah. So, and then is, the thing you get back is less impactful because you also have the frailty token at that point. Yeah. So I think on top of the codex is just being like an insane, insane on rate. It's also something that's not intuitive to play optimally against. And something that I kind of talked about this in the wolf pack. I think everyone's going to lose a couple games to codexes before you really realize like play patterns that would play around it better, I guess. Yeah. I think it's kind of, interesting because the inertia tokens are then going to be especially punishing for decks like azalea because when your arsenal is empty i think that's when these codexes obviously shine the most because if you're sitting on an arsenal you can continue your game plan as you were planning your turn anyways like you're just like okay i have these four cards in my hand in this arsenal card as long as I don't get red and legend or whatever, I I could I can just take this damage and do whatever I want back. Where that's not necessarily the case once you have like if they if you have an empty arsenal and they play a codex of frailty, you kind of have to like rethink how to recontextualize your entire hand after that point. And who knows, even if like you have like the right attack action cards in your graveyard already in order to like function through this disruption. And mm -hmm. 
like I said, it's just going to take a long time for people maybe realizing that they should be blocking with more impactful attacks a little bit earlier. Um, something like that, which is kind of a weird play pattern to do. I think even like Brody in the match, we saw like when you coronet peaked him, he just pitched a red drill shot to the effect instead of discarding it. And had he just discarded it, that zero for four arrow in his graveyard would have been super impactful in his graveyard for his Codex of Realty turn. So that's just a normal play patterns everybody used to. Like, oh, yeah, just pitch this red if I ever get the second cycle in this matchup. Uh, maybe I'll want to see it again. I got to keep the cards in my deck. But no, Codex of Realty says you actually don't want this card in your deck. I'm going to punish you for putting that card in your deck because you should have actually discarded it. Yeah, you want it in your discard pile so that when you cast this codex, you have it as an option to recur, basically. So, yeah, some weird stuff with this card. It's obviously extremely powerful, but it also has, like, one thing that I guess I do appreciate is that the powerful card is something that's, like, kind of high skill to use optimally or get the most value out of it. Is And that's, like, I think that's just good design. I still think... It's more powerful than I'd like it to be, but it is good design that like it requires careful play on the side of the person playing it to get the most effect out of it. And the person playing against it does have some control over how much it kind of gets them, I guess. Say you're the one who's casting the Codex of Frailty. How often of a mistake do you think it is to still be discarding a card if you're the one casting the card? Because obviously, um, ideally, you wouldn't be casting out a zero cost hand or as your last card out of your hand. Yeah. Most of the time you're casting a codex, you should not be discarding because that card that you're discarding, you could have just blocked with it and gained two or three life. The times where you will be discarding will be either A, you didn't have the option to block with a card. Say your opponent didn't attack you on the turn before, and then you just get to your turn with like four or five cards to use. And you're just like, the most efficient thing to do here is using my codex with this card in hand that I can't even get resources out of, I can't do anything with. So in that spot, it's going to be okay to cast a codex um, and discard a card. If that's just, you just want the line that gives you the most points of value. Um, The other time is if you have an effect that causes you to draw cards. I mentioned Art of War in the Lexi list earlier. Sometimes you're going to Art of War, draw two cards, one of them is going to be a Codex, and the best line is still going to be to cast that Codex and discard a card. So you won't know that going into their turn when you're choosing your, or going into your turn when when you're choosing your blocks, you don't know Art of War is going to draw you Codex. Um, There's still probably ways that you can like think about what you're drawing and figure out that it's correct to block with a card maybe, but I, I don't really know. It wouldn't surprise me if some of the time it is correct to discard a card with the codex there. Sure. Um, outside of that, you really shouldn't be discarding with codex too often because you get to plan your turn and you want to use every card as a resource. Um, so if you're going to cast the codex and you don't have a way to use this card offensively, you should just be blocking with it. And that's, just kind of how it is yeah i was just double checking the language on codex of blood rot real quick yeah it's the only one that doesn't make you discard just because it already just takes the card from your hand into your arsenal slot so it's the only effect that doesn't make you discard i think codex of blood rots might be the weakest one but it makes the strongest token though so i, I think but that's also kind of subjective yeah, I think Codex of Frailty has the strongest effect where yeah, you're no, for your that. attack. <laughs> and then Codex of Inertia is also very powerful because you're both getting a random card and you're getting like you're getting the Ponder token, they're getting an inertia token. So Ponder token and a random card versus them getting a random card and an inertia token. It's like wait, sorry, but then they have to discard if they get a random card. So like you're you're going plus a card still there. And if you're empty handed and they already have an arsenal, then you're just getting a card off the top of your deck into your arsenal and getting a potter token. So it's still two cards for one card. So like inertia is very powerful, but hitting random cards is obviously less powerful than choosing what card from your discard you want to put in your arsenal. And if your well, opponent has they weren't a card, random. What happens if you know what card you're putting in your arsenal? Let's say you either have an opt effect like Lazalia does with the hat, or I think specifically the card that Codex of Inertia might play very well with is even bigger than that. Since you get to opt three, you draw a card, and then you get the go again for the quicken token. So you get to 
draw the card. Hopefully it's a zero cost attack. Attack with your zero cost attack. It has go again from the quicken token you just made. You then play your Codex of Inertia, put the next card from the top of your deck into your arsenal, and then attack with that. And I think like that interaction sounds very powerful to me. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That's not an interaction I'd really thought about. You can definitely play even bigger than that and these assassin decks, maybe even the ranger decks as well. And Codex of Inertia, I think it's a lot more powerful, obviously, when you get to choose what card out of two or three cards you want to put in your arsenal rather than just taking a random card off the top of your deck. Yeah, it's not something I've explored deeply yet, um, but it was just like, um, I guess if we want to jump, we're jumping around a little bit, we're going to talk about Uzuri since she's the also the hotness that kind of was I think the surprising hero in the top eight for sure. I don't think a lot of people were expecting Uzuri to get there. But uh, same Dando on Uzuri making the top eight on a really interesting list. Um, obviously, also playing three Codex of Frailty. I don't think he was playing any other Codex yet. But yet. <laughs> um, I think I like the deck overall, and I think it shows that there's something there to Uzuri. It's not obviously powerful, like what she's doing, because the rate is just like not super there. You know, people just like, oh, she two card sixes, two card sixes. Like, who, who cares? Uh, to pay, pay two resources to swing your stupid spiders. By. Like, it, it, like all of it on paper just doesn't seem like it's really there. But once, I think it's starting to shape up to be like the prime example of the game of the sum being greater than its parts basically where all this disruption is making it very difficult for your opponent to make like effective decisions so even though you're like not presenting the most efficient um damage or um rates on your cards if your opponent is making even worse decisions into your suboptimal plays you kind of pick up equity there yeah that that makes a lot of sense um i do think Uzuri is kind of a hero that I wrote off. I think she has a really bad ice center matchup, basically, without very much testing. It's hard to imagine this. Yeah, especially very, if you have like nine blues in the deck, right? Very red heavy deck. That hero ability, you want to attack with a thing and then you want to activate your hero ability for free to basically be casting your two for sixes um, by like attacking with a thing and replacing it with a thing. That gets interrupted by a frostbite pretty easily. And being a very red heavy deck, it seems like it would struggle a lot into Icelander. And that's like kind of led to me writing her off a little bit, but I don't know how relevant Icelander is going to be in this metagame. I hate to say it. And I probably still, Icelander is still definitely in my testing plans for uh, Baltimore. And I played Icelander this weekend, but Rangers are tough. Yeah, for sure. And I think based on the expectation so far, this deck that's constantly disrupting and putting the Rangers in positions where they're obviously not able to use all of their cards as effectively as they would like to also giving them the like frailty tokens are obviously very good against a class that wants to be attacking you with cards out of their arsenal every turn it's not the most insane value but like it definitely adds up you're making your opponent more inefficient there blood rot tokens obviously very good there as well and then the inertia tokens making it harder for them to have these set up arrow turns and utilize their equipment as effectively as they'd like to so the fact that she's a hero that has access to all of these disruptive on hit effects and it's always difficult for your opponent to know which one of these effects is going to be happening at any given time i think shows that she has like a lot of merit mm -hmm. and neither of the rangers well i guess lexi's a lot better at this than she used to be but with the fuseless lexi but neither of the rangers really have uh a ton of three blocks like all the pump spells basically, or almost all the pump spells block for two in Azalea. And Fuses Lexi has a good kind of three blocks because she's so arrow heavy. But like if people do go back to this Ice Lexi decks to kind of have more edge against Azalea, then their deck's gonna be a lot more two block heavy too, which means these command and conquerors are gonna go back to really punishing the Lexis. Yeah. And I guess we could talk about that because over the weekend, I think you one of your sideboard plans even included taking out Command and Conquer into uh, Ranger, right? <laughs> yeah. So basically, I played some games into Fuseless Lexi uh, Sunday morning to prepare for my top eight match. And every time I cast Command and Conquer, 
just every time without fail, they would just block with two, three block arrows. And I'd be like, this is so much worse than a wounded bolt. I just two damage worse. <laughs> so uh, my plan for the, the top eight match was actually to cut my CNCs and keep it all my wounded bowls. I actually, uh, that's not how I ended up boarding in the top eight match. Okay. Because uh, once I got my opponent's deck list, I saw there were ice cards and they also had Heart of Ice and Frostlock, which made Sink Below look pretty bad because you don't want to have a Sink Below in your hand when your opponent activates Heart of Ice. It's rough. So I actually yeah. ended up cutting Sink Blows and still need some reds and CNC at least blocks for three. So I ended up keeping CNC in. But it was definitely my plan going into the matchup if the list was what I expected it to be that I would be cutting the CNCs. So probably not a great sign for having CNC in your Ice Center deck if you're cutting in the Lexi matchup. Yeah. Although to be fair, against your opponent's very specific build as well, I think they were on Art of Wars on Lightning Press. So I mean, there's worlds where they have like a nice two block Art of War Lightning Press and a three block, and they can't cover up your CNC as well in that particular build of the deck. Yeah, yeah, definitely with the ice cards. The ice cards are what I think kind of pushes it over where CNC is like pretty good is when they have these ice two blocks, and even if they draw two or three arrows in an ice card. If they block with two arrows and they just have a stupid ice card left, what's their ice quake going to do if they don't have an arrow or their <laughs> whatever ice cards? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of my thoughts on CNC versus Lexi. If this fuses deck is the most popular way to play Lexi, I think Command and Conquer doesn't really belong in the ice deck anymore. That's fair. And then I guess last and certainly least, everybody's most loved hero still making another appearance in the top eight old man old heim just still trying to be fun police of the format bringing out his defense reactions blocking all these arrows and swinging his old man fist around yeah i think old heim looks really good into azalea like you need a very good plan from the Azalea to not just get fatigued by old Heim. He's going to be attacking you with disruptive things. You're going to be blocking with all your arrows because your non arrows don't block for three. They block for two. So you're going to block with some things. And then the turn that he doesn't put a lot of pressure on you or just sends some mopey attack that doesn't have a lot of damage on it. Then you're like, all right, it's time. I'm going to send in my big attack, my big dominated arrow for 12. And he's going to be like, kick staunch response, block for 10. Yeah, and if he really wants to, and then uh, he slides over his greater fist and um, stalagmite if he's playing that in the matchup, and just there's 14, 14 block. There you go, buddy. <laughs> so I, th- I think um, Old Himes, even the not super defensive versions of Old Himes, will really threaten to fatigue Azalea. I think you can plan on being a reasonably aggressive Old Heim and have just like a few copies of staunch response on top of the D reacts and your good blocking equipment. And these aliens will be sweating, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough to Is, do. Do you think there's any merit to playing a card like dread then? If you think these guardians are just going to be playing all these defense reactions and, um, staunches. So if the guardians are moving to like, I don't know how many defense reactions, but like a very, very, very large amount of defense reactions to where they're like reasonably likely to draw multiples in one hand. So then, they're on nine right now. How many do you think they would need to be on to make it worth it? Definitely more than nine. So the thing is, each time you activate Dreadbore, you get one damage, I think, instead of a card. Is that mm-hmm. right? Dreadbore gets plus one for a resource. So yeah. you're basically giving up the roughly two points if you value a card at three points that you'd get from having death dealer it's probably slightly worse than that but um over the course of a game you're giving up a decent amount of damage by having dread war instead of death dealer and then you have to make up that damage in the amount of times that they have a defense reaction in their hand that they can't cast and they don't get to just arsenal instead because like the play pattern against dread war a lot of the time with old time is you have a defense reaction in your arsenal, you'll block with a three block from hand, and you'll use, use a defense reaction from arsenal. And that still covers up most hits. That does get messed up a little bit by Remorseless. And if they have, like, they're going to have three copies of Remorseless also to go with and the Dread Increased board, the stops. tension, I think, is played commonly. Does increased attention stop from arsenal? Yeah. So it pairs well with Dread Board, too. Okay. Yeah. If you have, so with those effects, maybe it is good enough. I didn't. I haven't seen increased attentions, but that doesn't, it's not surprising that that would be a good sideboard card. Um, I think the biggest issue though, is 
Old Heim just got another nice tool that doesn't say defense reaction on it, but is essentially a defense reaction in peace of mind. I hate Oasis for Spite because you spend one resource and a card to stop four Sorry, damage. it's release the tension. Re- there's increase the tension and release the tension. Increase the tension is defense reactions can't be played from hand, I, I think. Uh, re- release the tension is your next arrow gets, gains plus three and defense reactions can't be played from arsenal. I don't know why you're both... In- I think... I, I think increase is f- <laughs> not from hand. I'm going to look this up now. This is okay. some live research. I don't, I don't know what increase the tension is. Maybe it's not even a card. I'm just a crazy person. Increase. I'm going to keep talking about Increase the tension. Yeah, it's the inverse. Uh, your next arrow gets plus three, and defense reaction can't be played from hand this chain link. It's from everybody's favorite set, Crucible of War. Cool. Anyway, so... <laughs> Oldheim also got a new tool that is not a defense reaction, <laughs> peace of mind, and it's reasonably better than Oasis Respite because you're spending one more resource over Oasis Respite to block the same amount of damage and you get a ponder token, which is worth a full extra card. So I think... And plays around inertia tokens. It does play around inertia tokens too, yeah. So I feel pretty confident that peace of mind is a card that We'll see some play in old times as a counter to Azalea and switching to Dreadbore and all these anti-defense reaction cards isn't going to stop peace of mind. Is there a card that makes it so the opponent can play instance on your turn? We got to look for those effects now. <laughs> Not that I know of, but I guess I'm or, or you can pick up Lexi thing. and play Heart of Ice attacks yeah, all these effects even even if you do that they can still just start with peace of mind and or respond to the heart of ice with peace of mind since it's an instant and it just says the next damage you don't have to target anything like with oasis uh, you have yeah. to target something peace of mind you do not so that's fair heart of ice is good against oasis i guess yeah but then you fire your blue bolton shot and they absorb all four damage <laughs> they, they block with the three block oh i'm lucky <laughs> <laughs> so i i do think if Azalea is taking over the metagame, I expect we'll see Oldheim rise back to kind of basically block her out and run her out of threats. She only plays like 30 to 40 pump spells. Got to survive until she uses up her 30 to 40 pump spells and then the game's over. Okay. Do you think Icelander still beats up these hyper defensive Oldheims then? Um, I think so. Just because like if the Oldheims are spending a bunch of slots on these defense reactions, then... Icelander looks pretty solid against them. You have time to set up your frost taxes. They still have Warhorn. It's similar to like the Charles Dunn thing where they can Warhorn you and they can remember it's back their Warhorn to do it multiple times and try to kill all your frost taxes. Um, I don't know if that's enough to beat Icelander consistently. I honestly did not play any more of that matchup than I needed to for Indianapolis. <laughs> Fair enough. So uh, more testing would be needed. I I think like if you're not, if you are playing this super defensive old time, you probably do need to tech for Icelander as long as you think it'll be a deck that people bring. Because if you don't have Warhorn, you're just going to die. You, if you don't have pressure and don't have Warhorn. Yeah. Such is the fate of Frost Hex. Mm-hmm. Frost Hex so, very good against fatigue. Confirmed. Confirmed. I've seen it happen. So um, I guess, though, so if the decks are just kind of narrowing, does Azalea start polarizing the format in a similar way that Starbo did, where basically you either have to be like this deck that's able to block efficient, very def- uh, efficiently and um, play through these disruptive on hits or be this deck that's, you know, presenting these big threats and disruptive on hits? Possibly, because I think the aggressive decks kind of like, if you look at the top eight, the only aggressive decks were Rangers. And I guess there was a Briar that slid into top eight, but the game, like the, the top eight game of the Briar versus uh, Brody's Azalea was on stream. And I went back and watched that game and it did not look close at all. Just like yeah, I would the imagine. Briar couldn't effectively block what Brody was doing and just kind of got ran over and died. Mm-hmm. So these more aggressive decks, if they are, if they can't beat Dominated Red in the Ledger, that's 
not a great start. And then on top of that, Azalea just presents as much damage as they do a lot of the time with their good hands. Like Lace with Blood Rot and Infecting Shot both are at rate with plus twos on them when they hit. And Aggro decks are not very good at blocking those. So it's 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 rough. It's not a good spot to be. And then no. getting two for one with Codex, also not great. <laughs> Yeah, because the aggressive decks are obviously can't prioritize keeping an arsenal every turn cycle. They're just going to want to play out their five card hand at some point, and when that happens, and they just line up this codex. Yeah, re- regardless of whether they have an arsenal or not, the codex is still going to be a two for one because it gets an arrow and then it gets a Potter token for one card. As long yeah. as the other doesn't have to discard and whatever it, so. value it gets out of the frailty token, then at that point as well. Yeah, the frailty token is just a free roll basically, and the, the frailty token. Against Briar, a lot of times Briar wants to attack with her arsenal and her Rosetta Thorns. Sometimes the frailty token is worth two damage too. Yeah, very good. So I think basically Aggro decks will need to have a plan going into Azalea. I think Azalea is going to kind of police the Aggro decks in the same way that like Starvo kind of beat up the Aggro decks for a while. Do you think there's any like dark horse decks that get better now in this format that maybe if it's more consolidated, it could be their time to shine and kind of help compete in a more like fleshed out metagame? So the most obvious one is decks that can effectively block out Azalea. We already talked about old time. I think Bravo could potentially be there. You played Bravo this weekend and had a bunch of armor and a bunch of defense reactions. So kind of similar to how an old time would approach. You have like these big attacks that Azalea has to block or she doesn't get to have a turn. Sometimes you give them dominate and then she can't block them and she can't have a turn. <laughs> like Spinal Crush and uh, choke Crippling slam. Crush. Choke Slam. Very good. Choke Slam is very good. Um, and I think Bravo could potentially be pretty good in, into Azalea because of that. Um, I don't know what other decks I would look at. It needs to be something that's disruptive. So like, for a second, I was like, maybe the Brutes are okay. Like, I thought about Levia having uh, Carrion Husk, but she just doesn't have any disruption. So Azalea is just far enough above rate that without disruption, you're not going to be able to keep up with the Brutes, I don't think. Um, even the though the ninjas kind of fall in that same boat as the Brutes at that point then, where they're just presenting good, efficient damage and not really disrupting in a meaningful way either. Yeah, I think there could be hope for something like a Mask Momentum Ninja, where... When your opponent's not blocking you at all, you're just going to draw like two or three extra cards over the course of the game, and that might be enough. I still would lean towards Fi over Katsu. I didn't tell the story, but I spent, or I haven't told the story on the podcast, I don't think, but I spent a week and a half working on Katsu leading up to Chicago. Realized Katsu just wasn't good mm-hmm. enough, and that's why I kind of fell back on ice later. Yeah. Um, he definitely has turns where he goes off, that's for sure. Um mm-hmm. I think it's still just a little too inconsistent overall. And it kind of, I feel like Hatsu is a deck that punishes your opponent's mistakes more so than everything, because as long as they're kind of picking up on what you're putting down, so to speak, when they're like, if Katsu's just like, oh, yep, I just don't block this turn at all. I have a five card hand. And it's like, okay, well, you're gonna, as long as I can block like your first attack and like your third attack. And the reason why blocking the first real attack is so important is so that way he just like, you kind of like make them have it on the combo chain at that point, as opposed to just letting them free roll whatever chain they're, they're breaking. Um, at least this is how I approach the Katsu, Katsu matchup. And uh, so I always block the first one and then you don't want to let him get the mass trigger down the line. So you block somewhere on the second or third one that hits post that. Um, at least that's how I at least traditionally played against mask momentum. Yeah, and this is kind of why when I was working on Katsu, I was kind of looking at the zero for fours with Go again, like uh, Scar for a Scar and Ravenous Rabble, is it kind of gives you an awkward breakpoint to block on Chain Link 1, and then you can go get whatever combo piece you need to set up your turn. But it just, like, it didn't feel good enough, basically. Yeah, and to be fair, the the combo piece you're starting with most of the time is also a very awkward breakpoint. It's surging strike like red surging strike it's not like that's like a walk in the park to block it still requires usually two cards from your opponent so yeah or card and uh blocking equipment in the case of all the old times that beat me up (laughs) yeah so and he still just dies to red in the ledger like every other deck that wants to go super wide yep yep flick flack good against the go wide aggro decks not very good against the go tall ones i think Five potentially could be a little bit better if you can find a way to get enough on hits in your five deck that are getting value. Like 
mounting anger is kind of been a staple of fight X for a while. Um, the, the two cost one engulfing flame wave, the one that if it hits, you kind of get mm-hmm. a card off the top. That card could be good in a ranger meta where you're expecting it to hit most of the time you play it. Um, the problem is you're still very vulnerable to red in the ledger and you don't have all the cards you just mentioned block two. Yep. You don't have great blocking <laughs> abilities and flame scale furnace helps with that. But I, I, I don't know. I wouldn't surprise me if there is a five build that is reasonable, but I, I just don't expect it to be good enough. And then I guess the last one, I want to talk about Briar a little bit more. I think Briar theoretically should line up okay into Azalea if you build a Briar deck for that purpose. Um, every turn you're expecting to hit, so you'll get your Embodiment of Earth, which helps you block Azalea pretty effectively, especially on the turns that she doesn't dominate, because she does dominate a lot of turns, but not every turn. Mm-hmm. You can play um, you can play Defense Reactions okay in Briar, and she has a lot of four blocks without having Defense Reactions through that Embodiment of Earth. And she can pretty easily threaten a lot of on hits like snatch is pretty easy to include in her coax the commotion is another good one um i'm sure there's other ones that i'm not thinking of but coax the commotion is a little dangerous to give it to azalea just because giving her a free go again kind of powers up her codexes even further for those turn cycles so yeah the the turns that you give her a quick token and she has a codex are going to be pretty rough but she's not going to have a quick or a a codex that often there's only three sure. in the deck now. Maybe more if we go go to uh, Inertia as well with the opt that you were talking about. But for now, the Azalea decks only have three, and they have they have Snapdragon Scalers that they don't really have a lot of use for other than playing one of the codexes. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I I think it's probably okay to go ahead and take that quick and token into Azalea, but I am not a Briar expert and I have not played any games of that matchup. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. Yeah. My issue with it is like kind of how I was saying um, about other decks. Like I just don't think stuffing your deck full of sink bullows is going to be like a winning strategy against Mm -hmm. Azalea. And also as we were saying, the raw rates aren't going to be good enough into Azalea most of the time you need to be presenting disruptive on hits and she room blades have some of those effects but usually they require very specific setups or dealing arc uh arcane damage so mm-hmm. cards like um the one for four that makes them discard when you've dealt uh arcane damage i can't think of the name of it at the moment and cryptic crossing where you have to discard uh an attack and a non-attack when you play that card in order to get a disruptive on hit so it's i could see a world where briar could definitely be positioned to start you know stepping up to the plate but it would take very specific builds um of her to to do so yeah that's that's fair um yeah i think there it's kind of weird that briar has been sitting at 900 some living legend points so it doesn't seem like it's worthwhile to innovate with her also because she's just going to go away so soon rip the band-aid like, off lss rip the band just <laughs> on the rat her just make her do what she did originally <laughs> she'll go away just give like just make like one wild tournament that off like just like one calling season just two like two or three callings where just come on step up to the plate briar and see what what happens because if she doesn't win those on a rat like we can kind of safely say at that point like they reacted too quickly and they didn't need to errata her to begin with. Like if they just waited for other decks to catch up to power level for the rest of the format, like it would have been okay, but she probably would have living legend by that point and who knows, but I don't know. Yeah. This is a, a whole other conversation. I think the cost of ha- having an errata in the game is like pretty huge. And when people have cards and say they do one thing and actually do another thing, that's not great. So especially like, I guess functional errata specifically are pretty, well, they already functionally errata her. Yeah, yeah, but I I also don't think undoing it makes a lot of sense either. She, Give her back ball lightning. Would that I'm help? fine with that. I can play my Death Dealer Lightning Lexi. No, I think the main reason that the ball lightning band that I've been convinced of right now is that like um, with all these prevention effects that they've been pushing more and more like Oasis Respite and Peace of Mind and then ball lightning effects happening, like I can't tell you how those interactions work, man. I, I, I'm a highly 
you know, I have a podcast about this game. I compete and play it a lot. But like, if you're like Roger, explain to me the nuances and the complexities of additional damage versus preventing damage and who controls what instance of the day. Like, I'm just like, I don't know. I don't know, man. Just so sure. I'm okay with ball lightning dot not being a thing. Sure. Sure. Just, just they like, they should have just made it. So your lightning attacks get plus one power, something like that. Like something clean and simple at that point, you know? Yeah, though, I think the idea was to make it punishing when it doesn't get blocked, and that just, like... Sure. And the, it also bu- bu- buffs power. that arcane damage effects on the card, so those arcane pingy dues from effects deal an extra one at that point as well, but, like... Yeah. Ball lightning, ball lightning, mark of lightning was a very powerful combination in Limited. Yeah, how, do, how, did, how did old time beat ball, 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 sting, sting, you know? Sting, sting, ball, 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 something like that, right? Too good. You got you got to let it die. You got to let it die. We all know old time beat up Briar before, but it's fine. There is, is, Winner's Whale was a messed up card. I'm gonna still miss it. Pulse of Eisenloft, good card. Every time, every time I look at the meta, and I'm like, man, I think old time would be good. I'm just like, I, my hammer's gone. Yeah, my hammer's gone. This trusty hammer that he was supposed to ride or die with he was supposed to ride off into the sunset as he became a living legend left him it's like it's like what, who's thor if you take away molnir you know just some guy uh so <laughs> the last deck that made top eight of the tournament was a dash deck it looks like a pretty typical ish dash deck a just lot got of some cards, D-reacts. got I some saw the dash sideboard. boost into unmovables a couple times throughout the tournament it was really <laughs> really? awkward yeah <laughs> It happened in the top eight match, uh, uh, and uh, it, it was against Uzuri, and it's just like, well, if they didn't boost away that unmovable, they would have had the unmovable to like block a bunch of these Uzuri effects, but instead they boosted it, and they didn't have the unmovable, and then they died, and that was kind of the gist of the game as I kind of watched it. Yeah, boosting without uh, with boosting with non mechanologist cards in your deck is a uh, rough. Yeah, dangerous game to play. You get one bailout with Achilles Accelerator, but like why yeah. <laughs> yeah okay and once again falls into that same thing that we've been talking about a bunch of decks in this meta lots of damage good rates no disruption struggle into rangers i'd imagine sure makes sense rangers are so strong i think their biggest weakness is just their equipment doesn't block very well yeah so it's just incumbent on decks to like disrupt them and kind of go through go over the top of them or um, really start making it so that they can't enact their full game plan because their full game plan is like the most powerful thing you could be doing in flesh and blood now. Like, I don't think that's arguable at this point. Sure. And that's, that, that's why I did play Bravo over the weekend. And what I learned over the weekend is that I don't like crippling crush because you make your opponent randomly discard and they keep the two cards that they need to win the game after you make them randomly discard and then you lose the game anyways. And you're just like, oh, well, what, do you, what can you do? <laughs> you don't like randomly discarding when it was used against you. You don't like it when you're using it either. Crazy. Yeah, just it's nothing but di- when I get randomly discarded, you know, I, I lose the important cards that I wanted to keep. You know, it happens every mm-hmm. time. When I when my opponent randomly discards, they they discard the cards that they want to discard anyways and only keep their powerhouse cards. You know, it's, it's, it's a lose-lose situation. <laughs> And not at all survivorship bias at at all at any point. Nope, it's just the way it goes. Just every time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, maybe Boomer Bravo. There's something there. So I don't know. The, the The problem is that I think you will struggle into these more defensive old times overall. If they're bringing big D reacts, it's going to be harder for you to like dominate your big attacks to push through damage because they're just going to have all these staunches floating around in peace of minds. Mm-hmm. And the reason to play Bravo over Oldheim is to have the dominate effect because when Oldheim presents a spinal crush, Dex are just able to put two, three blocks in front of it, move on with their lives. Mm-hmm. When Bravo dominates a spinal crush, Dex just block with one, three block. Rangers don't have any blocking equipment and they're sad. So that was kind of like the theory crafting behind it. And I was having a lot of success in testing. It just kind of you know, tournaments are hard. You know, I lost to a Reinar in round two, and then I lost my coin flip against Lexi, and that was my tournament. Rough tournament. Happens. Reinar happens, I guess. Yeah. 
I think I win that game if I just pummel on one turn, but like I was playing around to de-react, but I should have just made, made, you know, make them have it. Big fan of making them have it. I didn't make them have it. Lost the game. Sometimes like when you hold back because you're worried about them having it, you put, set yourself up to lose the game, whether they have it or don't have it. So yeah, yeah. And that's what I did. Not a good winning strategy. So, mm-hmm. Okay. Anything else you want to talk about? Uh, no. Cool. I guess like I don't like any of these decks. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that. It's just like this does not this does not seem like a meta that I am happy or eager to participate in going forward. Like this just does not. I, I feel like I feel like it's Starbo all over again. The more I think about it, and uh not happy i guess but that's just that's just my personal taste and preferences for heroes there are good things and there's like still a handful of decks that i think are well positioned i just so happen to just not be the biggest fan who knows maybe i'll become an icelander stan again over the next month and join you on team icelander but for now i'm just kind of like over most heroes at this point in time <laughs> that's that's fair it's just something that happens in card games. You know, you're not always going to love every meta. Not every meta is going to be for you. And you just kind of have to wait your turn until you find something that speaks to you. Yeah. I guess the good news is if the CC format's feeling kind of bleh, at least we have a new limited format to work on. Yeah, five draftable heroes in that set. We're good. <laughs> I like Riptide. <laughs> I think I've won maybe half a game with Riptide. And yeah, I've seen you crush them every them, game but... of that limited format over the weekend. You like were an unstoppable juggernaut, and then you drafted Riptide, and I saw you lose. And I was like, hmm, that's all I needed to see. That's all <laughs> I need to know about that hero. I just haven't figured it out yet. There's just something there to figure out still. Surely. How, how do you beat Block? How do you just beat people being like, Block? Surely there's something there that I just still <laughs> need to figure out. There's no doubt in my mind. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Surely. Don't call me Shirley. <laughs> What's that from? Uh, a movie called Airplane from the 1970s, I believe. Okay. Cool. You should watch your old comedies. That's your homework. Go watch Airplane and the Blues Brothers. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go watch Airplane and the Blues Brothers. I'm going to go try to figure out how Riptide works in draft because I still haven't figured it out yet. And then that's something that seems important before the Pro I, Tour. I imagine by the end of that, experience on both of our ends we will have the both exact same sentiment on riptide so (laughs) (laughs) but that being said everybody the next time you're drafting riptide and losing in your draft always remember mind your manners we'll see you next time